This video is sponsored by NVIDIA. Welcome back, everyone. In this video, I want to talk about what seems to be a fairly charged, controversial topic amongst photographers. We're going to talk about artificial intelligence or AI or machine learning, deep learning, whatever the buzzword we want to call it is. But anyway, this is more or less where technology is going. And I think that a lot of times photographers hear these words and they think that all of a sudden the robot's going to be doing all their work for them and it becomes very scary and we don't know what to do with that. So this is really important because this is where this is going and I want to have a discussion about how this impacts creativity. So not only is AI the buzzword, these days, but we're finding AI in all of the imaging software that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We saw this last year when Skylum came out with Luminar, and now they have a version of Luminar that's entirely AI-based. And then next thing you know, at Adobe Max this year, they introduce AI as part of all of their products. In fact, this is something they've been working on for a long time with technology that they call Adobe Sensei. Then we see the examples, which include things like sky replacement or neural filters to actually change somebody's face, make them look younger, older, smile, frown, turn their head. It's all very impressive technology, but I think what puts a lot of photographers off from this is that all of a sudden it is altering a photograph into something that we didn't put into it creatively. Now, I want to preface this by saying right now we are at the cusp of a lot of this technology, and so we're seeing demos and examples that will show everybody and educate on what those possibilities are, but I don't think that we've seen the full extent of what AI can do for us as creatives. I think it's important to understand what AI AI actually is. So if you consider the traditional way that we've worked in imaging on any computers, that you have some kind of software that brings up your image, and it's up to you as the photographer or the photo editor to make decisions and tell it what to do. In other words, the software doesn't know what's in the image. It doesn't care what's in the image. All it knows is that there are pixels, and there's colors, and there's brightness, and you have to do all the arranging beyond that. And so what AI does is it takes that a step further, and with deep learning or machine learning, is that you can start inputting enough data into the software to where it does something like become image aware or object aware. So in the case of the examples that we've been talking about, things like sky replacement or even being able to uh, change facial expressions or the age of a person, well, that's all based on object recognition. So software traditionally wasn't able to identify a human necessarily in an image, but if you start giving it enough data, in other words, you take hundreds if not thousands of pictures of people, tell the computer what to look for, that's where this machine learning begins. And so when it starts to recognize facial features like eyes, nose, mouth, hair, uh, bodies, ears, it starts to be able to understand what humans are in the image, and then it can start to make recommendations or even edits based on those. So if you consider like age, for instance, it knows characteristics of younger people versus older people. So what if it can take that information, merge it into a single image? So whether or not you are comfortable with this kind of technology is another story because a lot of people aren't, but this is essentially what it's doing. So how does AI impact us as creators in a more positive direction? This is something I'm actually really excited about. So so all the examples that we've seen so far have dealt with object recognition and thus image manipulation. But there's kind of two categories that I've observed that are possibilities right now. And so that would be one of them, this whole idea of objects and being able to suggest edits or manipulations based on those. Some of them are useful, some of them are just entertaining, some of them are impressive. But there's another category that deals with workflow assistance. So think of it this way. Let's say you go out on a photo shoot and you come back with cards full of images and you put these all into Lightroom. There are certain tasks that begin that aren't very creative at all, that are very pattern-based, that is just kind of us spending a lot of time repeating ourselves. So some of that can be culling of images. Some of that can be actual workflow when you open an image. Like, I'll give you an example here. Understanding how to get a correct exposure is a starting point. Understanding how to do curves adjustments. Sure, there is a little bit of aesthetic and opinion that goes into those. You may like your images more contrasty than me or vice versa. But when you go in and you start to understand, well, okay, if I'm going to create curves adjustments, adjustment, I can set a black point, a white point, so that's hard facts of how that's done. And then what if the computer were able to learn a little bit of how you tend to like your images and it gives you a better starting point automatically? This is something that intrigues me. I'm going to show you something that was added to Adobe Premiere that is one of my favorite examples of this because it's a massive time saver. So what I've got here is a clip of footage that I shot in New York City oh, a couple years ago. It was a beautiful summer day. I was out and this was a vlog that I released on the YouTube channel. Some of you may have seen 
seen it. Anyway, let's just say for argument's sake here that I don't actually have the original clips of this anymore. It's been a few years and all I have is the final. Well, I want to go in and do some work on here. And what is that work? Well, it could be a lot of things. One, I might want to go recolor some of the stuff. Um, I want to re-edit it and recompile it. Maybe I'm using it for something new. Or here's a common use too, is that I want to actually have an Instagram version of this. Now think about it this way. This was done in 16 by nine. It's the way I filmed it because its initial release was for YouTube. Well, let's say I want to turn it into a social post and I want it to be vertical video. Well, this requires actually going through, readjusting the frame and actually making sure the subject is centered in each frame. So there's a lot of work to do on this, but there's a couple functions that Premiere has in this newest version that I think you're going to be like just mind blown with. So the first one I'm going to do here is I'm going to just take my sample. I'm going to select the timeline here. And the first thing I would want to do is break this up by scene. There's a lot of scenes here. If you've ever done this, it's very time consuming. And the longer your footage, the longer it's going to take you. So I don't want to take a long time to do that. I just want it to put blade points where the scene changes. So what we're going to do here is go ahead and right click on the footage and we're going to go up and say scene edit detection. And it's going to ask us what we want to do, apply a cut at each detected scene point, And we can create a bin of sub clips if we want, you know, just depending on how deep you want to take this. It takes just a second to go through and analyze the scene before it works its magic. Now we have a cut point anytime there's a scene change. So I can go through and I can do color edits just to one particular scene, or I can reorder these, I can reuse them, whatever it is that I'm out to do. So this video was recorded in 16 by nine for YouTube, but let's say for a second that I want to create an Instagram version of this and it needs to be vertical video. Now, again, this is fairly labor intensive and I don't think it's that creative, but what we've got to do is create a nine by 16 frame. We've got to put all our footage into that and then we need to go through and make adjustments, make sure the subject is in the middle and so on and so forth. Well, there's an easy way to do this too. So what I'm going to do is over on the sequence here in uh, Premiere Pro, we're going to right click on the sequence and I'm going to just go up and say, auto reframe sequence. And once we have that selected, it's going to ask for what we want to do with it. Do you want to make it square format, which might be kind of useful for some people Well, we're going to do vertical nine by 16. And then we have choice here for clip nesting. Do we want to nest the clips or not? I'm going to say, let's go ahead and nest them. We're going to go ahead and say create, and it's going to take just a second, analyze, think through, and it's going to do a bunch of stuff behind the scenes that actually worked super fast. So now when I scroll through the timeline, you're going to see that it has every subject centered up in the frame in the right place and we retain all of the edits that AI did. So sometimes it might move something or it reframes it and so if something's not quite right or to our liking we can go in and make that change. These both are huge time savers and this is what I'm talking about and this is I think where the real power of this is going to come through when all of a sudden those tasks that were super repetitive that we had to do over and over and over again they're not so time consuming or repetitive anymore. This frees us up as creators to actually be thinking about new work or freeze our time up to actually go make new things. This all seems pretty simple. It's actually pretty complex from a software standpoint because you're essentially analyzing frame by frame the entire clip. You're comparing every frame to the next frame to see if there's a big enough change to where it's actually a cut point and it's a scene change. And so this is, gets pretty involved and this is something I've been talking about for a couple years now is that Adobe is starting to offload a lot of their intensive work onto the GPU. So if you're not familiar with the CPU, GPU, all these terms, well, it's just part of your computer. And it's essentially the GPU is a processor that just takes care of graphics intensive applications. This is good because if you offload the right things to the GPU, your software runs much more efficiently, much more smoothly, and you get much better performance out of your machine. The computer that I've been using, by the way, is a 2020 HP Envy 15 laptop. So it's got a 15 inch screen, 4K display. It's also touch, which is very cool. The GPU that's in this machine is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2060. 60 with max Q. This laptop is actually an NVIDIA Studio laptop. So NVIDIA Studio is a partnership that NVIDIA have been working on specifically for creators where they're partnering with not only PC manufacturers in certain laptops that are certified as NVIDIA Studio, but also software manufacturers and hardware manufacturers like Adobe, Blackmagic, Autodesk. There's two things that I think are really cool about NVIDIA Studio. First of all is the commitment to creatives. So when you think of RTX or ray tracing graphics cards, you usually 
usually think of gaming and really graphics intensive applications in that arena. And it's always been something I think there's been a need to put an emphasis on creators and creative work, whether that's 3D rendering, whether that's video work, whether that's still photography. These are tools that we need and the power that we need behind it. And I love to see that NVIDIA has a serious commitment in this direction. The second thing that I think is really cool is these are some of the most amazing laptops from a performance perspective that you're gonna see anywhere. This is actually one thing I really like about the Envy. So laptops are great when you need a lot of performance and a lot of power on something that is mobile. You can transport it, you can take it to a coffee shop, you can travel with it, whatever it is that you're doing, you work at home, but you don't always have access to plug in a second monitor that is calibrated. This is a much better screen. It's one of the nicest laptop experiences that I've ever had, especially when you're doing stuff like still photography and even video color grading. If you're using an NVIDIA Studio laptop, one thing you do want to make sure that you've got installed are the correct drivers. So there's two different types of drivers. You have studio drivers and then you have gaming drivers. So if you go into GeForce Studio, you can actually select which ones you want installed and this will pretty much optimize your performance based on either gaming or creative work. So check out the HP Envy. It's actually one of the better laptops that I've used. And mainly for me, it comes down to speed, but also color display on that screen. And this is what I'm the most impressed with. I will put a link in the description. NVIDIA also have a deal right now where if you buy any RTX Studio laptop, you can get three months of an Adobe Creative Cloud subscription absolutely free. So once again, I will put links in the show description. And I do want to give a special thanks to NVIDIA for sponsoring this video. So one thing to remember about AI is that we really are just on the cusp. We're right at the doorstep of new technology and what that's going to be able to do for us. And every time that I've seen this throughout my years in photography, it's always kind of the same thing. You have something that presents itself. A lot of people are not willing to accept it. And then eventually they start to accept it. Eventually it starts becoming better and more useful. And then you kind of move on from there. And then everybody looks back and they think, how could we ever have gotten along without this? I mean, this goes all the way back to when everybody was shooting film. And then the big thing was digital photography. At first, everybody hated it. Nobody wanted to go there. And then you had all these photographers that were talking about going digital. And it was a big deal. You had to replace your whole system. A lot of times you had to replace even lenses and all the computers and stuff that you were using. And so you had to go digital was the buzzword back there. Well, then everybody went digital and now they wonder how they were ever able to do without it. But I think it's important not to look at something like sky replacement technology or what you can do with someone's age or facial expression. Those are things that are built to show off possibilities of what we could do before. I don't think they're going to stay at the center focus of what AI does, and I definitely don't think they're predictive in the sense that this is where it's going. It's all going to be animated imagery that looks real. That's not what AI does. Think of it this way. As Ray Dalio says, everything in nature exists in patterns. So for instance, the sun comes up in the morning, it goes down in the evening. That defines what a day is. When you start getting into that further, you realize that seasons can affect exactly what time the sun comes up or what time the sun goes down. They affect the color of light. They affect the temperature. They affect everything. And so when we start getting down to macro levels, you see that everything has a degree of predictability about it because we do them in patterns. Now, creativity does play an important role in here because typically we think of creative work as doing something new. This is the whole point I'm trying to drive home here. If we're spending all of our time on repetitive patterns and tasks that really don't involve much creativity, then our time spent being creative is considerably diminished. So the whole idea of using software or technology to reduce the time that we have to spend on stuff that is not very creative and it gets very repetitive, the more time we have to spend on the stuff that is important, which could be going out and photographing new things. It could be creating new types of videos. It could be a format change. It could be a style change. It could be things that really will make an impact on your work. I think this is exciting because it has the potential to accelerate your potential as a creative, as a photographer, and what you're able to do and where you're able to take that. Consider Ansel Adams for a second. We think of him as the great landscape black and white photographer, the father of printing. He formalized it. He educated. He wrote books that today are still invaluable on the subject and are a great source for any photographer to understand exposure, the zone system, how light works, how what creates a balanced image. You're looking at somebody who was very prolific, very successful, very innovative. At the same time, he had studio assistants. He knew where the right cutoff was, and I think that any great mind of our time understands that. You have to understand what tasks are repetitive, what you can 
throw off to somebody else or something else in the case of technology. And this is where all this comes together. I would love to know what you guys have to say on this because I think this is actually a really interesting conversation. I think it's really interesting to see that people get very fearful with new technology where I don't think it should be that way at all. Sometimes it's how it's marketed to us. Sometimes it's how it's presented. I don't think that's the case here. We hung up on sky replacement and facial expressions and we need to think beyond that into what it can really do for us. So drop a comment below. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, later.